Welcome to Windy Night Stories. This story is pretty short, so just for fun, after the story is over, I have added a, a bonus clip of me trying to say a sentence that includes the word bewilderingly for about a minute. If you want to listen to that, continue on after the story. If not, you can stop listening after I say the words, the end. Tonight's story is Before the Rain Came. The two women are alone out on the wooden deck when a barefooted girl climbs over the railing. They both look up in surprise, because beyond the deck is a steep and overgrown hill that leads down to the Mississippi River. No one in their right mind would attempt that bramble-covered, rocky hill without shoes on. And anyway, it's October. The end of October, exactly. The 31st. Yes, Halloween. And the weather is much too cold for the thin dress this girl is wearing. After all, that's why Olivia and Virginia are alone on the deck at Toby's. The weather. They sit at a table whose umbrella has already been taken down for the season, while around them on the weathered boards of the deck, the other tables are out of order. The chairs moved and turned in every which way like dancers frozen in place on a ballroom floor. Even the waiter hasn't been staying long between orders. He just comes through one of the French doors leading to the bistro inside to check on them from time to time, and then flies away again, clutching his tuxedo coat to his slim waist. It's really too cold, too late in the season, for any kind of attire on Toby's deck, but the two women are not ready to let summer go yet. Both still sport Caribbean tans, and Virginia is wearing his sunglasses even though the sun hasn't shown his face all day. Inside, the fools are out in their costumes already, trying to drink enough to ensure that they make fools of themselves later. They will pretend to be goblins, vampires, monsters, ghosts. That's why the two women watch this girl approach with more amusement than consternation. What kind of costume is this? Or has her Halloween gone wrong already? She looks wet. Yes, wet. And though the sky looks like it could shed precipitation any moment, it would be more likely to be snow and not water, and anyway, it hasn't done anything yet. Could she actually be wet? Or is it some kind of divine, clingy new dress? They are well-dressed, Olive and Ginny, expensively dressed, and still attractive enough that one of the younger men inside will press his face against one of the French panes of the doors from time to time, trying to gauge his chances of breaking into their absorbed conversation. Wisely, each turns away without risking his pride. They have been sitting there virtually undisturbed for three hours, laughing and drinking white Russians, and now along comes this young woman, treading across the deck with her white, dainty, bare feet. As they watch, she glances over her shoulder with an odd look, perhaps something akin to fear. Hello, says Olivia, crossing one smooth leg over the other. Can we help you? Yes, says the girl and it's clear that she is frightened. Now that she is closer, it's clear that there is something strange about her clothing, but it is the odd, flinching glances over her shoulder that command attention. Can I sit with you for a few moments? Of course, says Olivia, and another strange expression crosses the girl's delicate features. Deviousness? Cunning? Of course, says Ginny, and pulls over an errant chair for their guest. Thank you so much. Is something wrong? asks Olivia. She looks over at Ginny, but the sunglasses do not offer a clue to her friend's thoughts. Nothing's wrong, says the girl, glancing over her shoulder again. Obviously, you need a drink, says Ginny. What can we get you? I don't know. Wine? Absolutely not, says Olivia. She is still studying the girl. What is it about her? Have a real drink, or a gin and tonic, at least. Ginny wiggles a finger and the waiter whisks through the French doors. Toby, she says, even though it's not his name, it's just what they're calling him. We need a gin and tonic, a good one. Coming right up. And two more Russians. It may be Olivia's imagination, but it seems that under his obsequiousness, there is a slight reproach this time, as if he feels they've reached their limit. Make mine a double, she tells him. One gin and tonic, two Russians, one a double, coming right up. Are you looking for someone? Ginny asks the girl, who has just looked over her shoulder again. Why, do you see something? Olivia can't see any farther than ten feet without her glasses. Beyond the rail of the deck, 
The wooded hill down to the river is nothing more than a gentle blur to her, a blending of the leafless tree branches and fallen leaves. There is a road down there, she knows, and the old sluiceway the flour mills once used, because Toby's is one of a collection of -of turn-of-the-century flour warehouses converted into fashionable bistros along the river. But she can't see any of it, and she wonders what Ginny can see as she looks past the girl's blonde head toward the river. I don't see anything, said Ginny. Well, says the girl, that's good. Olivia decides she knows what is odd about the girl's clothing. It's old-fashioned, a costume of some kind, of course, but looking more lived in than most costumes do. The drinks have arrived, but their guest doesn't touch hers. She says nothing, fixing Olivia and Ginny with her absorbed stare as they tilt their glasses to their lips. Horrible day, says Ginny conversationally, chewing ice from her drink. Oh, yes, says the girl, a kind of vicious smile toying with her lips. I hate this kind of day. Doesn't it just make you feel awful? What, Halloween? Is it? No, I meant this kind of ugly, cloudy day. Doesn't it make you feel terrible? Yes, says Olivia. Why do you think we're sitting here half-lit in the middle of the afternoon? Only half-lit, asks Ginny. She's inscrutable behind her dark lenses, a woman with a narrow face and plump red lips. I see, says the girl, and for the third time in a matter of minutes. Olivia senses a sudden, brief increase in the darkness of the day, as if a heavier cloud has passed overhead. The first two times she'd ignored it, but now she looks up at the sky with narrowed eyes. It is still a heavy expanse of featureless gray clouds, the way it's been all afternoon. There will be snow, or cold rain, for the trick-or-treaters, that's for sure. I can't stand days like this, the girl is saying. They just make me want to give up. We have given up, says Jenny. She has drained her glass again, and the waiter appears at her side. It seems to Olivia that he flashes the untouched gin and tonic a reproachful look, and she waves him away from her double. She is only half finished, and it is taking its toll on her. The dark shadow seems to pass overhead again, and this time she could swear the girl flinches. Ginny is oblivious, existing already in twilight behind those dark lenses. Cigarette? asks Olivia lighting one for herself and offering the girl one. All this nervousness and glancing around is making her nervous herself, and she is a little relieved when the girl reaches with trembling fingers to take a cigarette from the pack. Olivia offers her lighter, a stamped silver one a man gave her in Barcelona a decade or more ago. The girl puts the cigarette between her lips and struggles with the lighter, looking confused, unable to make it work. Finally, she puts both on the table in frustration. I just can't bear this kind of day, she says in her odd diction, and flashes an oddly calculating glance at the women. It makes me want to throw myself off the falls. Off the hydroelectric dam, maybe, says Olivia. There's no falls down there anymore. Hasn't been in sixty years. Oh, that would work, though, says Ginny, warming to the subject. Bink onto one of those concrete abutments, and then sploosh into the raging waters. Better than the falls, if you ask me. Why, asks Olivia. It lacks the smallest amount of romance. Why not just gas yourself in your car? You've got to roll with the times, says Ginny firmly. Roll with the times. Right, Toby? Absolutely, he says, and sets her new drink on a fresh napkin before disappearing inside. I don't understand what you're talking about, says the girl, looking confused. What does it matter how... Ginny, says Olivia. You can't tell me jumping off the dam's got the same appeal. Off a waterfall has it all over that. Old-fashioned, says Ginny. Get with the times. Anyway, off a building is the best. It's got everything. Scope, magnificence, meaning. You swan dive off the observation deck with your arms out and scream all the way down. Ah! And then they scrape you up and shovel you into a casket and put your high school portrait on a closed lid. Yes, says the girl, smiling at both of them, because then you wouldn't age another day. They would all remember you when you were young, instead of old and wrinkled. A glorious car crash would do the same thing, says Olivia, now that she thinks of it. A screaming, skidding smash into a brick wall at ninety miles an hour. Crude, says Ginny. Nothing like the graceful swan dive. Olive, what's the tallest building in town? You're so good at that kind of thing. Well, says Olivia, the IDS tower, I guess, but that's so tacky. Yes, What's classy? And Olivia can read her old friend now, as if she could see those cat-green eyes right through the dark shades, 
those eyes that could always speak volumes to her even while the pouting mouth was saying something completely different to a man, a lover or a husband. She searched her memory. The fauché, I think. Shorter, but much more elegant and graceful. No, 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 says the girl, and she flinches as Olivia could swear that the shadow passes over them again. You are making a joke out of it. Imagine that you are old, that you are old, and you are weak, and you are ugly. It'll happen, you know. You will be some day. Well, I suppose it will, says Olivia, considering this proposition. I suppose it will. Wrinkled like old mummies, says Jinny, always game. No, says their guest. It won't be a joke. You really will be so ugly no man will look at you. Now this is an odd thing to say, and Olivia squints at her. The girl's plain face is wet with tears or sweat, and the blur of the black clouds behind her is frightening. The sky is doing something, billowing around, boiling into a snout-like projection in two roiling black clouds like curved horns. God, she wishes she brought her glasses. Is that what infant tornadoes look like? Jinny seems to be looking at the clouds, too, but she's still pondering the issue. I could do that, she says. Could do what? asks Olivia, still eyeing the clouds. Be ugly. Be really ugly. In fact, I suggest that when the final day comes, I'll be uglier than you by far. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, I'll be so ugly they won't even be able to prop a photograph up on my casket. They'll have to paint one of those forgiving portraits, like they used to do for royalty. I'll, says Olivia, speaking slowly to give herself time to think, will be so ugly that they won't even be able to have a picture. There'll just be a short descriptive paragraph on a chalkboard near the coffin. The girl looks ready to be ill herself. Behind her, the curling black horns are rolling, roiling, growing longer, and the snout-like cloud bends nearer. Come now, says the girl a bit desperately. We will throw ourselves off and they will all be sorry. They will all wish they appreciated us more, and we will be beautiful forever. Think of the sound the rushing water makes just before you hit it. Think of the roar just before you drop like a stone into the cataract. Come now. No, says Jenny, and now she takes off her sunglasses and raises a sculpted red eyebrow to Olivia in that way she has. No, dear. No, says Olivia, and the girl pushes back her chair and stands in terror as the darkness descends upon them again, her face contorted, her clothing wet, her hair soaked and limp. When did it start raining? Because it is now. Big, cold dollops of water that hit the tables and the empty chairs and rock it into their drinks like wayward comets hitting a liquid planet. No, 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 screams the girl again, and the sheet of rain descends like the wing of a great bird and obscures her from sight, and her voice, still calling out denial, fades under the thunder of the rain. Run, shouts Jinny and has the presence of mind to grab up her drink before scrambling to the French doors where she and Olivia enter and stand, panting, watching the sheets of rain come down. Where's our little friend? Jinny demands of the waiter. You go out there and help her in. What are you talking about? He says. The girl. Are you stupid? The girl who was sitting with us. But there was no one with you. Jinny is launching into a shrill denunciation when Olivia remembers. Her lighter. She pushes past the stupefied waiter and rushes out into the downpour, making her way to the table. On it the drink glasses are full of water and overflowing, dropping ice cubes onto the glass tabletop. There, too, is her silver lighter, and beside it the unlit cigarette which she scoops up and carries with her back into the bar. She steps between her feuding friend and the waiter and holds the sodden cigarette up to his face to show him the faint smudges of lipstick around its filter. You see, she says to him, you see, she was really there. Her words are lost, though, in the roar of an autumn storm so violent that it is like trying to talk at the bottom of a great cataract. The End The change seemed bewilderingly... 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 The change seemed bewilderingly. The change seemed bewilderingly sudden. The change seemed bewilderingly sudden. Bewilderingly, bewilderingly. The change, the change seemed bewilderingly sudden. I don't know, maybe good enough.
The change seemed bewilderingly sudden. Bewilderingly, bewilderingly, bewilderingly. The change seemed bewilderingly sudden. Yet spiritual chemists Yet spiritual chemistry is a process incalculable. Yet spiritual chemistry is a process incalculable, past finding out, 